Hello and welcome. I'm Adi Keo, Editor-in-Chief of the AMA Journal of Ethics, a proud co-sponsor of today's panel discussion. Thank you all for joining us. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Matthew Winia, who will be the moderator for our distinguished panel. Matt, along with Dr. Tessa Chalouche, co-edited this month's issue of the AMA Journal of Ethics on the legacies of the Holocaust in healthcare. Valuing human worth based on a hierarchy that regards one group of people as superior to another is not simply history, but it's a false and hateful ideology that we still must reckon with and fight against today as health professionals and members of the human race. So without further ado, I turn the program over to the director of the University of Colorado's Center for Bioethics and Humanities and my longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Winia. Matt. Thank you, Adi. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to do really brief introductions um, of our panelists uh, because you will have had a uh, you will have had a, a, a program that has a, a more robust description of each of their work. Um, I have to say, even the robust description really does not do them credit. <laughs> These are extremely um, accomplished and uh, and uh, Im important folks in the in the worlds in which we all travel. Um, let me start though. Um, I think David Barb was going to say a word um, of introduction. David is the president of the World Medical Association um, and a former president of the American Medical Association. David, did you have some prepared uh, opening comments? I do, Matt. Thank you very much, and I will be brief. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be part of this today and give some opening remarks because the importance of this subject uh, today, this ethics conference and the events that we pause to remember can't be overstated. Uh, the saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, contains much wisdom. And we gather today to remember the atrocities committed by physicians 75 years ago and others through the years to make sure that we and future generations of students and physicians do not forget that the Declaration of Geneva, which was drafted and first adopted by the World Medical Association in 1948, as a direct result of the acts of physicians that we're discussing today, calls upon physicians to maintain the utmost respect for human life. And it further states that we will foster the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession. Those noble traditions are deep and broad, but include the Hippocratic Oath, which speaks to our obligation to teach students this art, an art which certainly includes the ethics of our profession, and by extension, the need to remind them of those times when physicians have violated those ethical principles. And I know this is a secular conference, but I believe that the Judeo-Christian literature contains some guidance for this conference today. And I'm going to paraphrase the connected verses from Romans chapter 10 and Isaiah chapter 52. Those say, how can they remember if they have never heard? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? And how will anyone tell them without being sent? How beautiful are the feet of the messengers. Those of you in this conference today have the opportunity to be the messengers that go and tell and make sure our students remember the critical importance of the ethics of our profession and recognize when they or their colleagues are tempted to stray from those. So I really appreciate what you're doing. I thank you for this and I look forward to your discussion. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you again, David. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to run through again a very brief introduction of each of the folks on the panel, and then we'll start with asking some questions. I'm going to this is in no importance. I'm doing it alphabetically, even though as a W, I don't love alphabetical, but that's what we're going to do today, just for simplicity. So uh, I'm going to start with Dr. Rebecca Brendel. 
Dr. Brendel is a psychiatrist. She's associate director of the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics, where she leads their master's program. And uh, Rebecca and I and several others had organized a program to bring um, health sciences students to Auschwitz last um, spring, which of course had to be canceled because of the pandemic. Um, but it, it certainly connected us. And I look forward to sometime in the near future um, re-establishing <laughs> re that program. Uh, Dr. Tessa Shalouche next is the co-director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics and the Holocaust. She's also co-chair of the Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust of the UNESCO Chair of Bioethics. She is the co-editor of the casebook on bioethics and the Holocaust. And for 15 years, she has taught an undergraduate course on medicine and the Holocaust at the Technion faculty. Audie also mentioned that um, she and I co-edited the AMA's Journal of Medical Ethics, uh, Journal of Ethics um, special issue this month. Welcome uh, from Israel, Tessa, so happy to have you. Thank you for staying up late. Um, next, Dr. Patrice Harris. Dr. Harris is the immediate past president of the American Medical Association. She is a private practicing psychiatrist. She is also a strong and effective patient and public health advocate. She was the first African-American woman to hold the position of AMA president, and she is widely recognized as a thought leader on health equity issues. She teaches at both Emory University and the Morehouse School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Next, Dr. Patricia Haberer Wright. Patricia uh, has received multiple mentions already today. She is the senior historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, a dear friend. She's served at the museum since 1994, including for a time serving as the senior historian for medical crimes. So has special expertise in this area. Um, and this is of course how we first met was around the deadly medicine exhibit uh, back in the early 2000s. Next, Dr. Sabine Hildebrandt. Dr. Hildebrandt is an associate professor of pediatrics and a lecturer on global health and social medicine at Harvard, where she teaches anatomy and the history of anatomy. Her work has focused on the history of anatomy in National Socialist Germany. She's the author or editor of several books about medical lessons from the Holocaust. And just this morning, it was announced that Dr. Hildebrandt will serve as co-chair of the newly announced Lancet Commission on Medicine and the Holocaust, Historical Evidence, Implications for Today, Teaching for Tomorrow. And that actually brings us uh, coincidentally in alphabetical order to Dr. Richard Horton. Dr. Horton is editor in chief of the Lancet. Uh, he has authored two uh, Lancet editorial pieces calling on the medical community to the task of remembrance and teaching on the lessons of the Holocaust for our profession. And uh, he was, I'll presume, a key mover in the Lancet's decision to impanel this commission on medicine and the Holocaust. Thank you, Dr. Horton. So glad to have you with us today. Um, next is Mark Levine. Dr. Mark Levine is past chair of the American Medical Association's Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs, the body that stewards the AMA Code of Medical Ethics. He is now clinical professor of medicine and a faculty associate at our Center for Bioethics and Humanities, where he chairs our Lessons Learned Working Group of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Contemporary Bioethics Program. And finally, but not least, Dr. Peter Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is director of the Indiana University Center for Bioethics, and he is an associate professor of medicine at the School of Medicine. His center recently started an annual program of remembrance and learning on the lessons of the Holocaust for bioethics. Peter is driving right now, so we have asked him to keep his <laughs> picture and audio off until he gets parked, um, and then he will be joining us. So let me, um, let me start by asking a couple questions um, about why it might be important. So we're gonna to get to the challenges uh, of teaching this, but let's start with why should we teach this? And uh, you know, I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Horton, and just to ask, um, the Lancet has, has created commission uh, panels in the past. Um, these have typically been around clinical issues, 
that are uh, difficult, controversial in one way or another. Um, and you know, this morning it was announced that, that we will be seeing a Lancet Commission on this very topic. So I, I wonder if you could tell us, how does the Lancet think about topics that might be appropriate for creating a commission and how did this topic um, come to the top of your priority list at this particular time? Well, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, let me let me give a very brief um, history because I think it's instructive. Like you, I don't have any direct connection with the Holocaust. Um, and so it might seem strange that we've taken this issue up um, with such enthusiasm as we have. Um, let me take you back to May 2017. That's when we published a collection of articles in The Lancet on health in Israel. It took two to three years to produce that series. Um, uh, and I would travel to Israel on multiple, multiple occasions to uh, um, work with the authors to produce those articles. Now, the Holocaust had been on my school curriculum, um, of course, as a historical memory, a terrifying memory, but still history. Um, it was in the past, something that had happened and uh, wasn't present today. But on my visits to Israel uh, over those two or three years, I came for the very first time face to face with the fact, the reality that the Holocaust was very much alive and well in the lives of um, so many Israeli citizens. And the Holocaust was still with us. That really hit me. Um, as somebody who's not Jewish, living in London, um, not really mixing in, in, in Jewish communities, I hadn't appreciated just what a clear and present danger the Holocaust still was. That got me reading. And remember, from 2015 to the present day, we've seen a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom and across Europe. Um, attacks on synagogues, attacks on uh, Jewish members of our society. And so it seemed to me that a significant act of resistance might be to make the case for the teaching of the Holocaust on the medical curriculum. And that was the piece I wrote in 2019. That then opened up a network of Holo Holocaust scholars, including people like Shmuel Rice um, and several others who uh, are part of the commission are on this panel. Um, and as last year was taking place under lockdown, uh, I started reading more and more about the Holocaust and its relevance and connections with medicine and, and medical science. Wrote another column in November last year, expanding the reasons for teaching the Holocaust. And then that was the moment, coincidentally, that Shmuel and uh, Sabina um, and Volker Rolke wrote to me, making the proposal for this commission. And it was really the perfect moment to establish a foundation for scholarship for translating that historical um, evidence into uh, a set of contemporary lessons, not just for teaching, but for the practice of medicine today. Thank you so much. That is um, super helpful to hear that history, but both personally um, and from a sort of a recent historical perspective. You're right, I, I resonate with um, your experience of being um, sort of confronted with the contemporary relevance of this. But, uh, Patrice Harris, uh, I wonder if I could turn to you next because um, your time as president of the American Medical Association was in some ways marked by a renewed um, strong emphasis on issues of health equity in organized medicine in the, Amer in the United States. And I, I, I feel compelled to say this was before the pandemic. Um, it was before COVID came and really shone a floodlight on the inequities in care and outcomes that we see here. And I wonder if you could help us put this historical context into um, contemporary uh, perspective with regard to um, issues of racial justice, white supremacy, health equity. How do you see these sort of fitting together? history and today? 
Absolutely, Matt, and a wonderful talk uh, earlier. And I just want to say a huge thank you to the organizers of this discussion. I know that my longtime colleague, Dr. Jerry Lazarus, uh, made a connection for me and uh, just have been able to see his work over the years. And he is now on the AMA's Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs. And I also am honored to be on this panel with Dr. Brindell, who I had the uh, privilege of appointing uh, to the AMA's Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs. I forgot about that connection. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, three psychiatrists, but we'll, we'll keep that a secret. Um, and also an honor uh, to see Dr. Barb uh, as president of the World Medical Association just for the group. The World Medical Association is reviewing and changing top to bottom the International Code of Medical Ethics. And I actually happen to be representing the AMA on that work. And so lots of connections here today. And then the final connection is what you teased within your talk about the, the through line, the common themes as we are thinking about and talking about lessons from the Holocaust and, and what we are seeing today um, in our contemporary, I hope, uh, review of what's happening around health inequities and racism and all of the issues that you mentioned. And clearly not new issues, right? Uh, but people have asked, well, why? Why are we paying attention? Or why are others who weren't paying attention previously paying attention now? And I, and I believe a couple of things, and others believe this too. First of all, there's less opportunity to look away, right? And so again, we, we see these issues, a bright light. And because we are all involved and engaged and candidly less distraction, there is less opportunity to look away. Um, there's less opportunity to say it's someone else's problem. I heard you say, I don't have a direct uh, connection with the Holocaust, but you know what? I think that's the point here. Uh, mm -hmm. For far too long, uh, the people that have been impacted directly have borne the responsibility of leading the conversations and having the conversations. And again, right now, everyone is having the conversation and that that is a good thing because the burden has been uh, for far too long on those who are impacted, particularly again, African-Americans, communities of color who have been directly impacted by these disproportionate um, health inequities. There's also less opportunity to just skim the surface, right? We are having to look what I call beneath the headlines. You know, again, not new that we have these health inequities, we see them as communities of color are hospitalized more, die more, sicker with COVID. And so now we have the opportunity to examine these health inequities pre-COVID. And also now we are looking at, uh, looking beyond sort of blaming the victim, which we sometimes have done, particularly when it comes uh, to these uh, disproportionate health inequities. Uh, but now we are, saying words and speaking words out loud, uncomfortable though they might be, racism, white supremacy, uh, police brutality, injustice in the criminal justice system. So all of these things are coming to fore and we are having conversations about structures and laws. Matt, you mentioned um, regarding housing policy and redlining and mortgages. And I was thinking, um, I'm involved in some work here in Atlanta and they looked at uh, the interstate highway that simply cut through longstanding communities of color. And so they, in some ways, decimated those communities, but then folks still lived around uh, these highways, which also uh, has led to issues around environmental injustices. And so there's the through line uh, there. Um, and what about how we, I chair the AMA's opioid task force, and what about our history policies of um, responding to substance use disorders, um, particularly around opioids in the 70s and the 80s when it was mostly communities of color, our society's response was incarceration. And now uh, when over the last decade or so, we've seen the impact on um, those with power and privilege and uh, non-communities of color, our response is appropriately, and I'm glad uh, for this as a psychiatrist and someone who's worked in addiction, I'm glad we are now thinking about treatment, uh, but we again cannot, just as we cannot uh, forget 
um, our history, the world's history around the Holocaust, we cannot forget our history around a lot of these issues. And again, the structures, um, the individual issues, but also uh, the systemic um, issues. And so that brings us to what are we going to do, right? Because a lot of conversation, but we have to uh, figure out what we're going to do. And I would say that the good news is we are having discussions around accountability and ownership and actions. Now, of course, in this, in our short time together, we can't solve this problem, but I think um, there's an opportunity here, which we are having today is elevating these issues, uh, connecting them uh, as appropriate, and then continuing to have these dialogues as we look to action. Thank you. That's so, so helpful. Um, the, the points both about the, the why and also the how uh, sort of next steps. I think it's super helpful. I, I do want to turn to a couple of the conceptual challenges in teaching this um, material, this history, which is so painful um, and difficult and so egregious that, uh, you know, it's sort of hard to learn from. And I, I, I'm going to reflect back again, sort of personally, because when I first started giving talks about this, um, I got to say, I stepped in it a couple times. Um, and it is easy to do uh, with, because this is a challenging history to talk about, especially if you're talking about it with people for whom it is you know, deeply personally affecting. Um, and so Rebecca, you, you're a psychiatrist. I'm gonna use you for uh, psychiatric advice now. Um, I, I wanna hear your reflections on um, this, what I consider to be sort of a fundamental problem in, in thinking about this history, which is this. Um, I feel like it's, I, I, I ought to be trying to understand how an otherwise normal human being trained in medicine and public health can become a Nazi and do what they did. And yet, um, if I do that, I feel like I am in some way uh, guilty of normalizing or excusing or explaining how someone, you know, can be rational and a Nazi at the same time. And I, maybe this is, you know, unique to me, but I want to know is, is trying to understand someone's heinous actions similar in some important way to excusing those actions? or rationalizing those actions? Yeah. It's such an important question, Matt, and it's such a challenging question to have to take on because in some ways, the way you frame it, if we look at not just people who are seemingly sane or normal, but physicians, right? Professionals yeah. with whom we share really fundamental commitments and say, well, how could they not only um, subscribe to a certain political affinity or persuasion, but actually commit heinous acts. In some way, right, what feels so, uh, for lack of a better word, icky about it, um, perhaps isn't that we're normalizing or rationalizing or excusing, but that we're forcing ourselves to have to look squarely in the eye the possibility, right, that it could happen to any one of us, right, that there was something about these persons and there are certain kinds of individual susceptibilities uh, that could lead us to be less than our better selves and less than the people and the professionals that we were trained to be and made really strong ethical commitments to. So I don't wanna take this too far um, or become hyperbolic in talking about this, but you know, I think one thing that understanding, one reason that understanding is so critical and one thing it leads us to is to see ourselves as individuals with susceptibilities along a continuum, right? And by identifying what susceptibilities uh, Nazi physicians had to see what we can do in our education, in our training, in our collegiality to promote ourselves as humans and as professionals, right? Rather, and to be uh, our best selves and advance the professions. I think, you know, to um, Dr. Harris's point, uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of parallels, right? A real reckoning that all of us, right, um, and in particular those of us um, uh, involved in organized medicine, have to make right now about the participation of ourselves as individuals, 
without really being aware of our privilege or our positions of power or reinforcing of power structures, how we ourselves have been involved uh, in uh, an ongoing history of racism and inequity within medicine. So I would say that from the individual level and how we ourselves embrace our uh, understanding of the humanity of ourselves and then also of our patients, right? To, because the first step in any kind uh, of, of wronging uh, to such a serious degree is a subhumanization all the way down to a dehumanization as you so eloquently said in your lecture. Let me make just two other uh, brief points related to your question because I think it's not just about individuals, but um, uh, at the level of the profession, at the level of our society and our public institutions, there are really important reasons also to develop this understanding. So first, right, uh, understanding how our institutions of medicine, our or medicine medical organizations, both have gone along with societal structures that have been unjust, right? In particular, we're looking at racism now, but there are many examples, right? Back to eugenics um, as well. Um, and, and also the ways in which our ethics, right? Have helped us and informed our ability to maintain sound boundaries between medicine and the state and politics, right? We've just been through a period with uh, extreme politicization of science Right? We're trying to come to a reckoning with that. It's cost us dearly in terms of loss of life in this country. And so the ways in which a strong medical ethics can safeguard the profession uh, and, and help physicians uh, live up to their ethics. Uh, one example uh, of a separation between medicine and the state would be the pro ethical prohibition on participation in execution, for example. And then also standing up for, for science and the places where our science also has been erroneous, race again being another example. And then finally, really important point about understanding, at the level of our society and our public institutions, we know from repeated studies in psychology, right, and, um, and social science, that no matter how much we cultivate our character and no matter how much we frame our ethics, that our behavior is highly susceptible to environmental influences, right? So we know this not just from extreme examples such as the Milgram shock experiments, right? Trying to understand in part, right? The legacy of, uh, of the Nazis, but also seemingly harmless example of things, how pleasant experiences might make us more altruistic or being in a rush might make us less caring. And so really understanding along a continuum of our susceptibility can help us create the conditions and institutions that promote our better, if not our best selves, both as persons and as professionals. So I thank you for the question. As you can see, there's so much to talk about. Um, I will uh, stop there and look forward to hearing from others too. Yeah, I've got a half a dozen follow-ups, but um, <laughs> well, uh, well, so one of my follow-ups, uh, I'm gonna direct to Tessa, but, um, but this is almost a follow-up to what you just said. Uh, this is an extremely complex history. Um, and it is extremely prone to a few core oversimplifications, if you will, right? Nazis are monsters, Jews are victims, um, the Poland is complicit. Right? These kind of basic sort of big picture oversimplifications are really common. And I mean, you've been teaching this for 15 years in an environment where um, many of the students will have familial connection. So, um, you know, strong connections to this. How do you, you know, take a history that is, uh, that has such extremes in it and, um, and get to a, a place of any kind of nuance? Um, or the sense that there is not one simple narrative that drives this whole story. Oops, you are muted. Yeah, thanks for the question and thank you for this really wonderful meeting and for all of those involved. Um, it is a difficult, it's probably the most difficult thing to teach. I'm a family physician, I teach family medicine, that's easy, diabetes and hypertension and public health are easy and COVID is even easy. But this is hard. This is hard to teach. And um, I'm often asked why I teach it, how I teach it, kind of 
why do you want to get your head around this? And we've been teaching for a long, for many, many years. Um, the answer is not black and white, as you said, even though many of the students, when they start, as all medical students think, we, they think medicine isn't actually black, is, an, is, an, is, is black and white. Um, you know, they are good people, they are bad people, and we basically the one of the ones that are considered to be the good ones, and we, we'll know the answers, but definitely by the time we finish medical school, we'll definitely have the answers. Okay, but you know, of course, um, it challenges the students, this topic to think about the gray zones, the big, big areas that in our lives, in our professional lives, of course, today, most of the areas are gray, and that's what the challenge is to talk to the students, and one of the ways that we we found works with them. And don't forget, we have many students, as Matt said, with family stories, with family histories of, it's already great grandparents. When we started, they were grandparents. Now they are great grandparents who were uh, survivors. But we have Arab students as well. Our courses not a, are not compulsory. And it's interesting to note that we, have, we teach in Haifa where there were large percentage of medical school is Arab and the kids, the Arab children choose to, to come and listen, to come and learn um, once again, because they live in a country where it's part of the history. So that's, an, that's a whole other issue and it's interesting in itself. But they have very little knowledge, most of them to, to begin with. And they, um, as I said, they take, as most young people do, everything to be black and white. And we, we talk the gray. And how do we talk? We use personal stories. You know. Uh, it, it's an ethics issue, but it's also a history issue. But we don't, um, most of our, our lectures are actually doctors themselves, physicians who practice medicine, not ethicists and not historians. They are they have physicians who practice in different fields, come from different walks of life to this subject, and, um, and can talk about it as physicians. And we use personal stories of people, of perpetrators, of victims, we have the privilege in Israel of still having survivors or family members of survivors to tell the stories, physician stories, people who are physicians today who tell the stories of their ancestors who were physicians during the Holocaust. We also have a very great connection with German um, physicians today who talk about their, their grandparents who were on the other side as if. So that we have a discussion with the students with German third, fourth generations today talking about how it affected them when they discovered what their grandparents had done or what their grandparents had thought, because not everybody did, some people just watched. Um, so that's another aspect of the gray area, as you said, not black and not white. We're using personal stories we find is the best way to get to the students um, to make them relate, they can, you know, once again, they're going to be doctors, they have to think about it as on a personal level, take responsibility for their own personal actions. And so it actually it really helps to tell the stories using names. The man who taught eth ethics at, at, at medical schools in Nazi Germany was a family physician, just like me. While he was teaching and ethics, Nazi ethics, it was compulsory for them, they had ethics as you said, they were leaders, leading ethicists in the world. He was teaching he was teaching patients. So we talk about the people. We give names to the faces. We talk about the victims. We have grandchildren of, as I said, of survivors who come. And basically, um, we talk about we use physicians who have been to Poland and have been to Germany and what they experienced there. We we discuss with the students how important it is to have these discussions, to visit there by making it. Personal, we actually make the students face their own humanity, their own vulnerability, and they learn also from this, the history that they can do not very much unlike what they think, but they can do very, you know, they can cause great harm if given the right opportunity. And that, as Matt said, we have to continually reflect and continuously debate with ourselves and our colleagues and our institution to keep the checks in balance. It's a continual process. There's no black and white of this, of the history and definitely no black and white of medicine. Once again, it's a lesson for all humanity. This is not a Jewish subject and the more you learn about it, we all recognize that of course, it's a lesson for humanity. It's a lesson for all of us. 
but especially for medical students who might, as I say, think about medicine being black and white, but will very soon be faced with the vast gray areas that exist in our daily med medical practice. And we firmly believe that this is one of the ways to provide a lens for them to talk about issues that no other topic at medical school will talk, will we'll, we'll get to the core issues of what it means to be a professional, what it means to be a, a doctor, in the real sense of the word, like this subject will. Mm. It's very difficult, but medicine is, as you said, Matt, if it's easy, then it's not ethics. If it's easy, then it's also not medicine. It's not professionalism. These subjects have to be talked about, and the difficulty is a challenge, but, but um, it's worth it. After so many years of doing, I can tell you it's worth it. You know, that's really nice segue to where I wanted to go with um, with uh, Patricia next, because um, the other way in which this history is complex is that it is just a lot. And the medical curriculum uh, is crowded already. And one of the things that um, our lessons learned working group has really struggled with is if you were putting together, you know, a talk or a or a brief piece of a you know precious curriculum to talk about this history, what would you include? And I, I'm going to target this to Patricia because she and I have had this conversation a lot. <laughs> and so, you know, in your thinking about this, what do you think are the are the really key things that like you should not graduate nursing school, medical school, dental school without having been exposed to this? piece of this big history. And thanks, Matt. Uh, and it's so great to see you and to be with all of my other fellow panelists today, uh, many of whom I know, and it's great to see you all. Um, of course, we've talked a lot about this, that there are so many messages that can be drawn from the Holocaust. There's so much nuance. It's a complicated history, as Tessa said. And for example, the Holocaust teaches us where prejudice can lead, how lethal it can be. It teaches us how fragile democracies are, even democracies as old and venerable as ours. But I think for the medical student, there are a few outstanding lessons. Uh, and these are less about history per se, the actual technical parts of the history, uh, then about the big picture lessons that we can draw from that history. And funny that you've mentioned both of them in your presentation today. I think the first big lesson is to not demonize those individuals who committed crimes, including medical crimes under the Nazis. I was just in a Facebook Live uh, broadcast discussion with the um, one of the premier premier experts on extremism in America, uh, Eric Kuglansky, the social psychologist, and we both agreed that people who work, uh, who follow extremist movements, uh, something very significant you have to understand about them, and that is you cannot demonize them. Uh, we can't view Nazi perpetrators as monsters because it distorts our understanding of them. The acts may be monstrous, but the people who commit them or committed them in this case are human beings, just like us, people who found themselves in a set of circumstances in which they made the choice to carry out uh, pure uh, uh, atrocities because they had the latitude to, to do so, because they felt compelled by peer pressure, because of ambition or greed, because perhaps they firmly believed in an ideology that told them what they were doing is right, a multitude of reasons. and. All of these reasons we can't categorize, um, and rather to categorize persons as monstrous or evil at their essence removes the human responsibility and the element of choice uh, from these crimes. And the other is also something you've mentioned and it's related to that issue of choice. And I'm gonna underline what you said as a fundamental truth about the Holocaust, no medical professionals uh, paid with their life or limb for refusing to commit um, the crimes like the ones Matt described earlier. It's a deeply held conviction among some that people who committed crimes under Nazism, whether it's medical crimes or crimes in general, were forced on pain of death to act as they did. But there is absolutely no evidence for this. And as I say many times in these kinds of talks, the dirty little secret of the Holocaust is that people could and did refuse and were allowed to refuse because there was always someone who would say yes and who would take their place. And in this light, 
uh, people had a choice uh, to do as they did. And in the cases that you talked about today, Matt, they chose murder. And so the big picture lesson is simple. What you choose to do matters. Um, now, I don't think that our medical students listening to this broadcast today will be in the same situation as German doctors in the 1930s and 1940s. No medical corrector, director is going to come up to them and ask them to commit murder, I hope. Uh, but like other professionals, as Tessa just said, they will be put into situations ordinary and extraordinary during their careers. And they're going to be a spot where there's peer pressure to look the other way. Uh, to catch an authority figure in an error and wonder if they can correct him in front of their peers. And of course, in our day and age, to do triage and to make that difficult decision perhaps of who gets that ventilator in this age of COVID, right? And I hope the message medical students draw from presentations like we all regularly give is to do the right thing, even when that's really difficult, uh, to do the ethical thing, not to let peer pressure or popular prejudice weigh into your decision to be an advocate for your patients. And one thing when Matt and I do this talk together, we often quote the German physician, the great uh, Rudolf Virchow, a German physician, one of the fathers of modern medicine who died in 1902, who says physicians are the natural advocate for the poor and by extension, uh, the vulnerable. And that is a really profound message. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad you got to do the Virchow quote because <laughs> I was realizing by the time I got to where I normally say that, that it was running short on time. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Um, Mark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you next on this, uh, what should we teach given the broadness um and complexity of this history? Because I know you and the Lessons Learned group have also been thinking about literal learning objectives that might fit into a curriculum around this. And Patricia also alluded to something that came up in the Q&A as well around do the ethical thing. And the fact that there were presumably at least some of these German doctors who thought they were doing the ethical thing. Um, Tessa has done some work on this, uh, how they were taught and trained to believe that what they were doing, even up until up and in, in including murder was ethical um, and that question of sort of, you know, what are the factors that get someone to, to believe that murdering people is ethical because it's better for the state? It's obviously bad for that person, but it's better for the big whole. Um, wh what are the factors that people have talked about as sort of leading to that change in ethics? And, and what would you uh, emphasize in teaching that progression? Yeah, I think one of, one of the challenges in uh, teaching uh, the Holocaust in contemporary uh, uh, health professional education is looking for contemporary relevance. And there are um, aspects of that which are uh, immediately relevant today. Um, uh, I, I think particularly in the area of uh, dual loyalties that um, uh, physicians today are uh, increasingly uh, in the United States employed. Um, they're employed by corporations for the most part or nonprofit organizations that act just like uh, corporations um, that are all focused on things other than uh, or in addition to the patient. Um, the, uh, the dollar uh, and the fiscal well-being of the organization um, is demanding loyalty and attention from physicians in the same way that the state was demanding loyalty from the physicians of um, the Nazi era. Um, and that's very dangerous, I think. I think we have an obligation to instill in physicians that their primary loyalty is still to their patient. Um, we know that this uh, tension between um, uh, the employer and the physician and the physician's loyalty to their patient 
is uh, is frequently an issue of um, that, that leads to burnout and uh, tension and stress within uh, the physician community themselves. Um, but there are other ways in which uh, the um, dual loyalty of physicians somehow gets um, uh, compromised also. And that's, um, that's in, in, in what we were talking about with um, racism in healthcare and disadvantage in healthcare. Um, in the United States in particular, we have evolved um, a, an elephant in the room of healthcare which is um, something that we got rid of already in the blatant aspects of separate but equal. But we have evolved a healthcare system in our country that um, has one set of healthcare, the, the Medicaid and the uh, community health centers, the safety net um, providers um, for people of disadvantage, uh, poverty and also for um, much more disproportionately of identifiable races. Um, and we provide them with a different level of care. Um, and we accept that. Uh, we have not uh, taken that bull by the horns yet and said that this is something that we need to pay attention to. So I, I think one of the things that I find very important for us to take from our experience with the Holocaust is to extract from uh, that experience those things that are relevant to physicians today. Another example is the physician's role in science, um, that we are the people who are responsible for making the scientific um, findings uh, uh, appropriate in the social environment um, that's appropriate for our patients and not simply to pick and choose um, isolated facts and incomplete conclusions in order to satisfy an ideology as we have seen uh, in the previous administration uh, uh, in our country dealing with the COVID. Um, but rather uh, being realistic, honest, and forthright in order to be trustworthy uh, to the people that we are um, uh, caring for, which is our patients, uh, both individually and collectively. So those are some of the things that I think are very important is for us to go into the history of the Holocaust extract from it those things which are pertinent and need to be taught and to make those relationships current and active. You know, um, Sabine, we've been talking about, I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Sabine Hildebrand here. We've been talking a lot about learning from history, but one of the reasons we really wanted to have you on the panel is because you've done such important and seminal work on learning from artifacts from actual physical things. And I, I don't know that there's a big difference between learning from history and learning from artifacts, but one of the questions that's been raised in the, in the Q&A and that I wanted to get your thoughts on is um, how do we think about learning from things that the Nazis left us, including data? including images, right? So you, you've done a lot of work on the Pernkopf Atlas, infamously uh, includes you know, images of people killed during the Holocaust, presumably without their consent, both killed and their images used without their consent. Um, and people still use this today. And there are other examples of, you know, things that were learned during the Holocaust that we still use today. How should we think about learning from the Holocaust in that sense? So I, I don't know if I phrase that question well, but history and learning from artifacts and data and the stuff that the Nazis did. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. <clears throat> so there are um, clear continuities uh, between this uh, apparently a far history and the present and right into the future. Uh, and in uh, when we look at uh, anatomy as a, 
a case study of a medical discipline that is part of medical education, health professionals education. Um, then we have here a very small field that illustrates very clearly some of the complexities of this history and the importance of looking at the exact details of this history. And uh, when I, uh, when I talk about this history and present facts together with, uh, with case studies, uh, with, 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 page, with, with stories of human beings, Tessa, that's an important point that you made before, that becomes uh, very, uh, very uh, tangible for the students, but even more so if I can show them uh, one of the books uh, that still exist from that time. And the Pernkopf Atlas that was created by an Austrian who happened to be a Nazi ideologue um, and used bodies of Nazi victims for some of the images is a tangible connection to this history. And when we go to Germany and actually much of the research on, on uh, Nazi medicine uh, was, um, was basically accelerated in the 80s and 90s when students discovered human remains in the anatomy and histology collections. And we are still discovering these. So here we have actually tangible connections to this history. This history is not over, it is with us. And even if we don't have only these human remains, not artifacts actually, Matt, <laughs> they're not artifacts, they're tissues from these victims, right? Um, that nothing can be more convincing and just, just the same if we bring a very detailed history, a clear history in anatomy, as, as I said, the field is so small, we can actually, uh, we, we know uh, the more than 200 anatomists who taught in Germany in the occupied territories. We know who was dismissed from their jobs because uh, they were persecuted for racial and political reasons. We know who remained, most of whom actually joined the Nazi party, some of whom joined the stormtroopers, others stormed the, uh, uh, joined the SS. We have the full political spectrum from bystanders to murderers, murderers that actually murdered in Auschwitz, which brings us to the origin of today's Remembrance Day, the victims there, and the importance to identify these victims, to retrieve their stories, which has been done for some of these Auschwitz victims by one of our colleagues. These stories are so tangible, so convincing, uh, that our students will not ever close their eyes. I give, you know, elective lectures, lunchtime lectures, because as we said before, there's no time in a medical curriculum, right? But my students show up and they understand, they will sit through that lecture, right? It's a complex history, but it's, uh, it's not that hard to, to teach uh, if you bring these Page, these, these victim story, the perpetrator stories. And also in the case of anatomy, you could show in greatest detail how a legal anatomical body procurement changed under the conditions of the Nazi uh, laws, the, the, the unjust laws, but they, it was legal and it was for these anatomists easy to say, well, we're only using legal sources. And Matt, you made that point very clearly before, is something, if it's legal, is it ethical? And that question actually, particularly in anatomy, brings us directly into the present because we have uh, anatomical body procurement, especially in the United States, uh, that is considered legal, but I would say is highly unethical, but that's a totally different story. But I can, you know, there are so many uh, aspects that need to be discussed uh, when you look at the detailed history, and that is going to be actually one of the main goals of our commission, right? Which, by the way, was, was um, the spiritus rector of that commission is Bill Seidelman, who started with the public inquiry around uh, together with Howard Israel 
the public inquiry into the Pankov atlas and the, not, the swastikas that were visible in this in this uh, Pankov atlas. Uh, so again, as as long as we stick with the details of the history and stick to the truth, we've heard that point before, right? the clear truths of this history, we can also show to the students where it becomes important to ask again, where are the things where we currently think we're doing the right thing, but that might be very wrong in 10 years time and 20 years time. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, Peter, I'm so glad you are uh, out of the car and safely home. And I, I want to turn to you as we're talking, you know, we're sort of on this theme of um, what should we teach? Um, but I, I also want to get to the how would a program get built around this at a school that doesn't have one already? Um, and I'm very aware that you have recently started a program at IU. And I wonder if you could just sort of tell us the story of how did, how did this come to you? What, what, what did you, uh, what, how have, what are the nuts and bolts of putting a program together look like? Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks for asking, um, uh, Matt, and, and thanks for having me on this panel. I'm just, just so pleased to be here. Uh, I think I think so far the conversation has been excellent. I hope to be able to contribute to that um, as we go forward. So um, the program you're referring to is the uh, Dr. William Silver's lectureship on Holocaust, genocide, and contemporary bioethics, which was funded in 2019 by a generous grant, a generous gift from um, Dr. Silver's to the IU School of Medicine, which is his his alma mater. And the lectureship helps uh, healthcare providers, faculty, students, and staff at the university uh, uh, reflect on the ethical lessons of the Holocaust and other cases of genocide. Uh, we never had a program on this before. Of course, our work in ethics had touched on these topics, but this was an opportunity to really bring things together and do something on a regular basis. So the program uh, each year brings a visiting scholar to the School of Medicine who lectures there and in the community. Uh, in 2019, we had a nice uh, beginning, a uh, uh, nice in a sense, when, when Matt, you came out and, and did your How Healers Become Killers, Became Killers lecture. And in 2020, we were, we were very lucky and honored to have Dr. Hildebrand uh, come and talk about uh, Nazi anatomy, uh, medical crimes and their victims, again, in the university and in the community. So we had the experience there, like you're saying, Matt, of, of starting a program up uh, recently. Now the process for setting it up, the nuts and bolts, I must say it was, it was very smooth. Um, you know, center, bioethics now is established at, at most major medical centers uh, in, in, in America anyway, and much of the developed world and, and beyond. Uh, and so we built on our partnerships uh, with other programs and groups at the university, including uh, people involved in ethics here, uh, people involved in medical humanities, uh, historians of medicine, uh, with the Holocaust, with Jewish groups, and then, of course, with genocide in general, uh, with other people interested in history and social justice. Um, so at every step, I must say, uh, we, we just found interest and excitement and willingness to contribute. Uh, the evening talk by Dr. Hildebrandt, for instance, at the university was really well attended, uh, and we had uh, people there who were medical students, others involved in medical humanities, others involved in the health professions. We have a very large health professions campus here. And so you have people entering all different parts of uh, healthcare. And we, we have a tremendous amount of interest uh, when we talk about the Holocaust. And again, as, as Matt, you say so beautifully in your talk, uh, you know, this is an issue for all uh, healthcare practitioners, not, not for Jewish ones alone in any sense. Uh, we did hold an event at a synagogue the first year and at the Jewish Community Center the second year. In future years, we, we plan to reach out to other community centers and again, groups we have good relationships with. Uh, from some of our other work in ethics and research ethics. And again, we've always had a lot of interest uh, from, from, from all of these groups. Um, we've also been successful. And again, I really appreciate that previous speakers have mentioned this difficulty of, of getting anything into the med, med school curriculum. Uh, it's, a, it's, a tight, it's a tight place. And so it's a fight. And there's a lot of, um, I would say, this turf protection as well as actual optimization of the education of future physicians. And so that's a, that's a hard one. We were lucky that we had a professor here who teaches anatomy. And his name is Jason Organ. I have to say that just because his last name is Organ and he's an anatomy professor. And um, all, all talks, despite the most serious topics, should have a good joke in them. But um, uh, Dr. Hildebrand actually spoke to his class. And Dr. Organ includes now discussion of the Pernkopf Atlas in his graduate courses, in his anatomy courses every year. 
And so again, that might be uh, an example of one successful approach uh, to, to bring things in through, through a course rather than trying to supplant or, or, or again, shoehorn another course in. As we go forward in our lecture series, which, which is annual, uh, we're committed to having speakers on topics uh, that link the history of the Holocaust and other genocides to continuing challenges for medicine and bioethics. Again, um, um, Matt, you and Bill have, have done this in Colorado, I think in a very impressive way. Uh, we hope to emulate that. Um, for instance, next year, we, we hope to look at uh, public health ethics and the perversion, of course, the idea of public health by the Nazis and, and of course, relating that to some of the challenges for public health ethics that we're seeing right now in, in the most painful way possible during this, this pandemic. Uh, and again, it's another example of how history of the Holocaust and other genocides and other atrocities can, can provide insight and, and direction to contemporary bioethics. I'll say one last word. At a recent event, actually an event today on the Holocaust Remembrance, a, a friend who was presenting here um, described it as, as, as the present being an age of competing narratives and, and encouraged those of us who talk about the Holocaust uh, to, to not try to win this, this competition, but to, but to be aware of it. And so, of course, in our lecture series, we aim to remember and reflect uh, a range of genocides and atrocities. We turn to the Holocaust, uh, but in no way we don't, we don't turn away from um, the great other atrocities, which are too numerous to count, such as North American slavery, Cambodia under Khmer Rouge. We, we just can't, you know, I, I can't even begin to, to, um, to give a good list. But um, the education of medical school uh, students uh, has to include a reflection on, on the capacity of, of man and, and woman to do, to do horrors to each other and to think about your role both in medicine as a citizen as we go forward. So that's, that's the deepest um, calling I find in this, in this series that we're starting. But, but again, um, it's a deep and challenging calling, but it's also one we've had a very smooth way so far at starting our program here. So thanks again, Matt, for the question. You know, um, I, I do want to build on what you just said and open this up to um, maybe a couple other people who might want to comment on this thought. Um, one of the reasons to focus on the Holocaust per se um, and not the massacre of the, you know, uh, in Rwanda or the Uyghurs or, right, there are many other genocides that have happened and are happening. Um, why, why focus on the Holocaust? Because it was a medically oriented, medically sanctioned, medically driven um, activity, set of activities to which we have a lot of contemporary connections. Um, but I think there is, some, you could say something similar, for example, about Unit 731 and the, uh, the atrocities carried out in Japan that were medical atrocities. And I do kind of wonder how, how, do, how do those of you who teach this um, address these other explicitly medically uh, oriented crimes against humanity, because there are other medical crimes against humanity um, that, that one might spend time on in a curriculum like this. Tessa, I, I see you have your, your, uh, your microphone on, so I'll ask you maybe for your first comment and then we'll go to others. Sometimes we do, I, I, not every year, it also depends, as I say, our, our course varies about, uh, it's not a strict uh, curriculum and it very much depends on who is talking and what he's going to talk about and who is available because as I said we try and make it as personal as possible but we have definitely talked about the students themselves bring up the issues of the other medical atrocities you know experimentation that's gone on for hundreds of years um, the Japanese units um, I come from South Africa there was a lot of stuff going on in South Africa when I grew up in apartheid South Africa, there was uh, certainly, certain, certainly what we could call medical crimes against humanity. Um, we definitely do discuss it as well. It comes up, it comes up mainly from the students. Yeah. Um, but there's still a difference. There's a very, 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 you know, there's, there's still a difference. It's not that same public policy all around that medicine was so, that symbiotic relationship that there was between medicine and, and the, the, the politics. Uh, it, it's a big difference. Uh, yeah. Or well, maybe in South Africa, not such a big difference. But, Dr. Yeah. Horton, did you, did you consider this as you were framing the uh, sort of charge for the commission 
um, whether it, well, how did you consider sort of the narrowness versus the broadness of looking at this kind of history? I think, um, I think my starting point, Matt, was um, re trying to convert the reasons why for me, the teaching of the Holocaust was such an urgent matter for the curriculum today, uh, for the lives of doctors who are in training today. Um, you, we've already touched on some of them in your talk. You, you mentioned the issue of Nuremberg. And although it took a little time for some of the principles of Nuremberg to become embedded in the Western medical discourse, I mean, the, the fact is that one can't understand medical research, it seems to me today, at all in the 21st century, unless one has a knowledge of what took place during the doctor's trial. I mean, the code was absolutely central to the final judgment. Mm. And, um, and the, the, this history is just not known to generations of medical students, um, even those of us who are supposed to be working in the trench, trenches of research, we didn't, we don't know. So that's just one aspect of it. Um, there are other aspects of it that are very relevant to de debates today about COVID-19. Uh, mm -hmm. Teaching the Holocaust, it seems to me, emphasizes two absolutely vital principles um, relevant to COVID-19. First of all, the infinite value of every human life. We've had this debates take place in my country, the United Kingdom, um, which have edged very, very closely to saying the life of somebody in their 80s is not worth the life of somebody in their 30s or 40s. And, and recently, a former High Court judge has explicitly actually said that a, a life of somebody who's older is less valuable. Now, now, I think the infinite dignity of a human being comes out of the teaching of the Holocaust. Secondly, our shared fate. Um, we are a common humanity that share a planet. Um, and we have shared threats. Uh, genocide is a shared threat that we, we, we have, as is the climate crisis, as is a pandemic. So I think that the, the Holocaust has such contemporary relevance. Um, that's where the urgency, it seems to me, lies. And it really feels urgent, this, 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 uh, this discussion that we're having. So I think that's where it came from me. But what I have to thank um, Sabina, Volker and Schmuel for is that they have, they have opened up for us um, a network of scholars, scholars and scholarship in Holocaust studies that we just would not have had access to. And I think one of the things that I'd learned, which I again wasn't aware of, um, is how rapidly Holocaust studies are advancing over the past 10 or 20 years there's real, real new work to be done. And we want the commission to be a place where that new work can flourish. Yeah, which is really interesting that, you know, this is history that is uh, 70, 80 years old. And yet um, some, of the, some of the images that I put up this year were not available one year ago, right? <laughs> These are images that have just become public um, 80 and years I, later. And I don't think that's known to many people because I, I've mentioned the fact that we're doing this commission to several of my um, to, to, to several of my colleagues, senior colleagues in in UK medicine, and they think we're just going to tell an old story that everybody knows. You know, just a bunch of bad doctors. Um, in fact, one a professor of psychiatry, I won't say who it was, but a very famous professor of psychiatry and former president of the Royal College here said that to me. Um, it's just a, you're just going to tell a story of a bunch of bad doctors in Germany. And that's that those are the myths mm -hmm. um, which you're drawing attention to, which need to be exposed as what they are, those myths. Yeah, there was the hard part is getting people. Well, doctors, it's a lost case. Physicians that are already physicians, it's lost. You can't teach them anything. <laughs> too late to teach them. It's too late. So that's why the students, but even for the students, when you say Holocaust or you say Nazi, they think, okay, it's that, as you said, Richard, it's kind of that small little group of crazy, you know, um, uh, crackpots and madmen. And they, that, we know that we've been there, we've done that. Um, 
the, the hard thing, the hard thing is to educate people as as you yourself say, you know, you you, you learned about it, you, you, us too. I, I'm Jewish and I come from a Jewish home and I live in Israel and I knew nothing about this before I started teaching. I went to Poland with a group of kids and, and I thought I knew what I was talking, what, what, what they were going to talk about. I didn't even know. I didn't know anything. It's very hard to educate because there's a kind of a wall up. So it's hard to find people to teach and it's hard to educate. But I think that this year, especially with so much academic devotion to it, you know, on the American side, the AMA, and now with the Lancet, uh, and at the initiation of Sabine and Shmuel and Folkel, um, I really think we are on the way forward because Richard Horton at the Lancet is not a crackpot. He, know, he, he must know what he's talking about. So, you know, somebody will maybe pick it up some doctors, but definitely students will have more of a, we'll, we'll be able to get to more students. I'm optimistic, I think. Sabine, you wanted to weigh in? Yes, I just wanted to say, I don't have any nihilism as to my older colleagues who may think differently, uh, because I found, and that was for me a surprise, because honestly, I've come, you know, on my third career to all of this. Um, and I, Basically, in the manner I had learned, I collected the facts and I presented the, the facts the way they made sense to me. Uh, and uh, I was confronted by colleagues in Germany, anatomists who were, you know, who had been doing this for 60 years and said, well, there's no history of anatomy in Nazi Germany. There's nothing we can learn from this history. And when they saw the facts, afterwards, they were really convinced. They said, I had a, a 75 year old man stand up in one of the lectures, uh, red faced. I'm so ashamed. I did not know anything of this history and I wish I had known. And it means that we teach differently too, right? Because it affects us directly. I'm an anatomy educator, I'm not a clinician, but this history goes with me into the dissection labs and to my students. And if I could add quickly, I certainly am not an expert in teaching ethics um, in particular, but I think um, the point that Sabine just made is to weave ethics into um, all of the other um, issues, you know, and so as we teach medical students about anatomy, what, uh, you know, can we learn and how can we weave uh, these important principles into anatomy? And, uh, you know, as we go on our clinical rotations, I, I, I think that um, sort of siloing ethics off to the side as if it's sort of something extra or something in addition to. And I, and I think that's the way we are now thinking about the issue of health inequity and racism. We need to sort of weave it into everything that we do as opposed to sort of teaching it as something extra or in addition to. It's such an important point. We, we've, taught, we've had this debate within the bioethics community for de generations now, at least my two generations that I've been in the field. Um, whether ethics is best taught as a standalone course or whether it should be integrated. And of course, the reality is it should be taught the way we teach anything else that is integral to the practice of medicine throughout. Uh, my favorite analog is acid-based disturbances. <laughs> you get taught acid-based disturbances in one class, but it comes up again during pulmonary. It comes up again during renal. It comes up again during CNS, it comes up again, right? It comes up over and over again because it's all, it's important across the sort of all of human physiology. And I think the same about um, bioethics and I'm starting to think the same about the history of, the, of our profession and the roles of our profession in society, that, that it sort of merits focused attention, but we also ought to be doing a deep clean of the whole curriculum and finding the places where it can be interjected as a learning point. Um, I, I do want to get to- I, I, When I talk to young students, I say, if someone offers you an either or argument, run, because it's typically both <laughs> and. And we spend a lot of time arguing what we could really be about the work of both and. Yeah. Um, we got a question through the uh, Q&A that I wanted to, uh, I'm going to give this to Patricia, but I think there are probably others who may want to say something. 
Um, I know it's a question you and I have been asked before um, at our presentations, why Germany, right? It, and I, I sort of laid out in the talk the ways in which the Germans actually were not at the forefront of the eugenics movement. They, they were not at the forefront of using policy to enforce racial beliefs. That would have been the US if anywhere. Um, and yet Germany created mass factories for genocide. What was different about the US versus Germany or other countries that sort of what was the perfect storm here? How, how did Germany end up taking this and running with it? Uh, how much time do I got with that? <laughs> <laughs> we have a solid five minutes. Oh, but I will let others speak. So I'll, I'll, I'll be brief on that. I, a lot of it, you know, we, we get this question all the time and you, you can go several directions with this, but we can explore at least a few of those. And, and one, of course, is that um, we talk very often in, in our discussions, you and me, Matt, about the closing down of discourse. Um, in the in Germany, for example, even before the Nazis come to power, eugenics is a very is more centralized as a um, which eugenics, which inspires the policies uh, that you were talking about today. Um, it really um, is a more centralized field of eugenics here in the United States. For example, if you look at work by Sheila Faith Weiss, um, her early works on this, you, you can see that in America. Um, eugenic centers are all over the country. There's no centralization. Um, clearly, there's there's no one political spectrum that espouses it. That's true in Germany too. But there is a Nordic wing that kind of mirrors what's going to happen in the with um, eugenics and racial policy in Nazi Germany. Uh, but what happens is when the Nazis come to power, they shut down reasonable discourse about what eugenics is and the, you know that's building this very radical policies and here in the united states that discourse goes on and already to a certain extent by the 1930s there's certain parts of of the international movement that that are wrongly discredited and you have that you have that discussion you have that that the talking about that here in the united states and even by i mean it's what the nazi nazi doctors discredit eugenics um, because of their policies uh, in Nazi Germany. But they're already starting to erode because that discourse is, is possible in the United States. And that is pretty roundly shut down. Uh, Richard Wessel has done a wonderful work on discussing how in the beginning, in the early 19, you know, in the early Nazi years, you even had people saying uh, legitimate Nazi doctors saying, well, there should be some mixing in the population because that's very good for the, you know, the race. And, you know, no, instantly shut down, of course, because that goes against uh, Nazi racial ideology. So I think it's that. I think it's the fact that Germany really here in the United States, you have a very individualistic society in Nazi Germany. You've had sort of, you know, some sort of effort to build that up already before the Nazis come to power, that it's all about the folk, it's all about the, 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 the core of the nation, it's not about the individual. And in an, in an arena where you have that, uh, individual, uh, the individual self is not as important as the German whole and the folk and the movement. And I, I think those sort of things, I could go on for a long time, but I, I think those are two things that are really at play here. Maybe my colleagues will add in to that. I definitely I wanted um, folks to at least get a chance to hear you talk about this closing of discourse because I have personally, and you know, a number of people in the chat and in the Q and A have been talking about sort of the political environment in the United States over the last four years and how do we move forward from this. Um, and I have over that time really um, taken solace in your view on this because it makes me when I hear someone saying something completely nuts think that's okay that's what robust discourse looks like it's when you can't say things it's when you it's when you feel um you know like like con like conversations being shut down that's when you really get to be worried 
Are there other thoughts on, on that? And, and the other question that has come up a lot on the chat, and I know we only have a couple minutes, but maybe a closing comment or two on um, this notion that the Nazi doctors thought they were doing what was right, with probably some exceptions. I'm certain there were people who, you know, in retrospect thought that was terrible what I did. But for the most part, including on the stand, including later in life, they did not regret what they did. They were, um, for the most part, unapologetic and didn't really understand why they didn't get the credit they were due for having tried to accomplish this really, you know, historical feat of creating a master race. And, and really, if they had been allowed to proceed, things would have gone pretty well. Um, so I, I wonder if anyone wants to comment on how, you know, the, this, this fact that for the most part, they thought they were being ethical. And, and what if, you know, the implication of that, of course, is what if those of us who think we are being ethical right now are just flat wrong and it's only history will come to us to say, how come you couldn't see that? It's a very complicated question, of course. One of the reasons is education as well. That's what they were taught. They were taught that for, for generations for, for you know the whole generation that went through the war even before the war and during the war at medical school that was what they were taught they, mm -hmm. they, they were they were the leading you know they were the first in the world to hold ethics classes at medical school and their textbooks if we read the textbook that was used it's um it's an incredible incredibly difficult read it but that's what they were taught they were told that this was the right way to behave um, as you say, none of them ever apologized. None of the Nazi doctors that were ever held trial, the very few that were, never apologized. They rationalized their actions behind ethical, was ethical reasoning. Um, deep down, obviously, I'm sure that most of those people, those human beings, as I said, it's a human story, must have realized that they were doing something wrong. Peer pressure and social pressure, and everybody else is doing it, and my mentor is telling me to do it, so it must be right. It, and then afterwards, you know, not only up, that's got a that's a whole other discussion, I suppose. It's a very complicated question, but part of the answer lies in education, what we teach our students and what role models we provide for them. You know, math, uh, um, math ethics. Um, Go ahead. You go on. Sorry. Uh, Peter, why don't you go first? And then Richard will get the, the second to last word. Well, I'll be quick. Um, I just want to say that you know, ethics education often faces this. You want to teach people to be reflective about their reasons, but not to be nihilistic. As, you know, well, there must not be anything, it must be right. If these people thought they were doing the right thing and they could be so wrong, and then nobody knows what they're doing. Um, and so I, I think that's an important point that. Uh, that our teaching and our encouraging people to reflect in ethics in general, either with specific contemporary cases or historical examples, is to be aware they have to look inside, they have to be aware of when they're being pressured and aware of their own ethical impulses. But of course, we could any of us be wrong in one of our decisions or many of them. And we, we do need to watch for nihilism. Well, I, I, I don't have a definitive answer, but I think there was a a philosophy that grew in Germany about this, this revolving around this idea of um, a life being unworthy of life. Mm -hmm. And I think once that idea was implanted, um, it's very interesting, very instructive. If you read Ulf Schmidt's um, biography of Karl Brandt, mm -hmm. um, and he sets out the defenses at Nuremberg and what Brandt said about what he did it's very instructive, you know, Brandt talked about honest euthanasia, that um, the people whose lives were taken were freed from suffering. And there's one very telling quote that Brandt said, if Hippocrates were alive today, he would have formulated his oath differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the perversion of thinking took place. Once you've got, once you've instilled this idea that a life has to be worthy of life or is unworthy of life, 
then you've lost your moral guide rails. And it, it then created its own momentum, which is very difficult to, very, very difficult to, um, to stop. Well, that is, um, let, let me, I'll close with, uh, with another quote. I was gonna use the Hippocrates quote also, because that is such a stark statement. Um, that, uh, that the ethics had shifted, the, the ground had shifted under their feet, um, which is not to take away responsibility for that, for that happening, um, but to acknowledge that the ground can shift and we need to be aware of that. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a quote that, uh, that Tessa and I use at the very beginning of our um, piece in the AMA Journal of Ethics this month, um, which is uh, from an American author who said, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And I think um, this afternoon has really uh, brought that home, um, the extent to which the stories, the narratives, the individual, um, the pieces of this history that we've discussed this afternoon um, have echoes, they have resonance, um, and they continue to be able to inform our actions today. And I want to thank all of you uh, very sincerely for joining us this afternoon. It's a, an amazing and I hope uh, useful discussion for those uh, listening in. Thank you all. <laughs>